Thank you guys so much for coming today. We've got a, a lot of a lot to get through in a short period of time. But first, I, I'd like to start with to say thanks to the whole team. Um, we've got a great team that allows me to be up here and put all this together. So just want to want to thank them, and I want to thank all of you guys. People vote with their time, and you're taking time out of your day to come here. And I hope you learned something. So just want to thank all of you guys for coming, and supporting the team, and being here. So without further ado, uh, we've got a, a bit shorter presentation on data, so you can read the sigh of relief, and then we're going to get into the fun stuff. So first off, what I want to cover today, rent and vacancy. Yes, there is rent, and unfortunately there is a vacancy, but we'll talk about that. Development pipeline, some sales trends in the marketplace, our fireside discussion, we're going to do our best to leave a little bit of time for some Q&A, so we can uh, talk about what we, uh, ask questions about what we talked about. So kicking things off first, uh, I always like to start with a, a, a slide of sort of where we are. And I really feel like we're just going through this big reset in the market, and people want to call it a downturn or a recession, but we really are resetting. We're resetting bases and prices, we're resetting where employment growth is, and I'm really bullish on the future, and not just because I'm here to sell things, is I think we are still in one of the most incredible regions in the nation, and I think you hear always darkest before the dawn, I think there's things that we're not talking about, we're not seeing the data that are going to lead to massive growth in the next couple of years. And it'll, we'll see what happens with that, but I think we're at that point of a reset. And I'm hearing from a lot of investors that if we're not at the bottom, we're close enough. And I'm hearing, I was just on the phone with some institutional investors yesterday saying, we're seeing inflows of capital. So there is, we're going to start to see some other side of the demand equation there. So looking at rent and vacancy, just taking a macro look across the region here, if you look at where rent was the end of Q4 last year, we were a tip over $1,900. So we were past pre-pandemic rent, but haven't really grown. So the end of the summer, we had a really slow summer, but we grew a little bit last year, and then we went down again. So last year across the region, rent was pretty neutral, and there were spots where people went up two or three percent, spots where they went down two or three percent, but we just did not have rent growth in this region. Now looking at the other side of the equation, the vacancy rate, this is coded in yellow, it didn't really move that much. So we started at 6.7, we went to 6.9. Realize that this data set is not normalized for building to lease up. So I generally find, depending on how much supply we have coming online, we're about 100 bips off. So if equilibrium is 5%, we're you know, at seven, so we're probably really effectively at six. So we're really at equilibrium across the market, whether it's on a rental side or on a vacancy side, or on a, the vacancy. Now looking a little bit more granularly, across King County, you can see we're about 2,000. We ended the year last year a little over 2,000. We went down a couple of dollars, but you saw that vacancy ticked up, and not just nominally 50 basis points, and it really is based upon new deliveries. And we'll talk about that more, we'll get into new deliveries. But if you look at what's going on in King County, we, we are in equilibrium, we may get into this coming year, this current year, some disequilibrium because of deliveries, but overall the market stayed stable. And I think that's really good when you look at you know, people talking to the East Coast that still think Seattle's on fire. Not the right type of fire, the wrong type of fire, and the burning down. It's not. I was just in the Bay Area, it looks good as well, but we really are at this reset stage. Now looking at Snohomish County, they've actually probably stayed a little bit more in equilibrium. We'll look at some of the data year over year in Snohomish. They grew more than any other market, and they had really strong growth, but across the market year over year, they were pretty flat as well, which shows that the demand supply equation is really in harmony, which is good, but it's not going the direction we needed to to get more dollars deployed. Looking down in Pierce County, net-net about the same year over year. So Pierce County has stayed stable outside of downtown Tacoma, which has a lot of deliveries. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it's been pretty stable. I'd say the market where we've seen a sort of it's been dislocated and it's getting back in equilibrium is Kitsap. We had a lot of units to deliver, deliver in Bremerton, and we just saw military contracts subside, and we saw a spike in vacancy rate at 8.7. Some of those numbers showed high as 10% or 14%, depending on when you look at the market. 
but overall it's getting back into equilibrium and that's why it's coded in green is we're starting to see that market absorb units. It's still far off of true equilibrium and I think it's going to take some time for markets like downtown Tacoma and Bremerton to catch up, but the good news is we've held on to rents for the most part across the region. Now looking at different segments across time, here we're looking at data for Seattle. I think this is what's most interesting of all the slides. We had the run-up, everyone was used to the run-up, we saw it go down in COVID, but if you look at it, post-COVID we had a rebound, and I remember well in April 2021, rents shot back up, and we were looking for this recovery or return to work. Well, if you look from there, it was a return to work that never really netted out to happen. So as of the end of last year, rents hadn't really moved back up. Now looking at vacancy, we saw a good run-up of rents in 2013, 14, 15, the developers caught up, delivered supply, and then a great thing happened in 2019, we delivered several million square feet of Class A office space. We absorbed all of those renters and we saw rent spike. And then, as you know, the vacancy went down, which is great. 19 had strong fundamentals, we had not anticipated March of 2020, and I don't really need to tell you the story there. But what we've seen is we've gone back down to a reasonable vacancy rate considering all the supply. What I think is most telling is if you look at the year-over-year -year rent growth for the last four years, it's nearly completely flat. Rents have gone up since pre-pandemic $61, which is de minimis on the total dollars. So 3% over four years in Seattle. This includes all the Seattle neighborhoods. There has been no growth. And I'll, I'll contrast this in a moment with the east side. Same phenomenon is happening down in California, in, in Northern California. San Francisco, four years, rents are completely flat across San Francisco. But if you look in the East Bay, you look in the South Bay, rents have gone up really high. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment, is just what I'm calling the ability to pay, but the unwillingness to pay. So if we look over to East King, and a lot of this is new supply in, in East Bellevue, West Bellevue, Overlake, these markets, we've had really good supply. We saw a good run up in rent because developers had not yet got to the east side as quickly as Seattle. We saw rents go off in COVID, but not that much up, not much. We had a run up, and the one market that's continuing to grow rents still is the east side. There was an article out just a couple, of days, a couple of weeks ago in Bellevue. Now the Amazon, I think they brought 2,000 people to downtown Bellevue. We're seeing stronger demand in downtown Bellevue. So the fundamentals have been really solid on the east side. And if we look at the flip side of that equation, we can see a lot of demand in the market early. Developers did not come in, so we saw occupancy really shoot up. Some development came into the market, so we saw vacancy on the rise. And then really since COVID, that market's come into you know, equilibrium but higher demand than any other market. Because this is the only slide we have where we're actually seeing rent growing while vacancy is declining. And it's the only market in the region. Now, it's priced as a T-bill, but the east side has remained really, really resilient. And if you look at total dollars in the same time period where Seattle rents have gone up $61, on the east side they've gone up nearly $300. And when you compare and contrast absolute rents, on the east side, they're about 2,400. In Seattle and its neighborhoods, they're about 2,000. We're not talking about a huge geographic distance. It's, it's lifestyle. It is purely lifestyle. And what I like about this is Bellevue is still going up, but once there is more desire to be back to work, and we don't have time to get into all my theories on that, I think, I think we're all gonna be surprised how much resilience there will be with return to work by 25, <laughs> six, and seven. But there is an embedded ability to pay rents that are 20% higher than they currently are in Seattle. It's not a matter of economic fundamentals, it's surely a matter of desire. So I thought that was super interesting. Looking at South King, um, good run up in South King has always been a solid market, heavily transacted market, not a lot of new development, did very well during COVID, it is actually normalized. And this is one of the few times I've got up on a podium in 10 years, almost 12 years, and talked about rents not going up in South King. So it's really interesting, and that's just because what we're seeing of economic fundamentals, especially in blue-collar jobs, we're not seeing wage inflation. And generally, we've seen that across nearly all markets. Now, looking at vacancy, we did see vacancy tick up early cycle because we saw a lot of groups going and doing act rehabs, raising rents, and there's only so much resilience in that market to raise rents. We also didn't see rents come up because of new development. Now, what happened is, 
we saw a lot of demand across Puget Sound, so vacancy started to go down, COVID hit went down further, but it's really ticked up because we've hit what I call threshold pricing. There's only so much you can charge, and they're dealing with a lot of delinquency still in that market. We recovered from delinquency early 2021, 2022. Delinquency really went down in 22 and 23, and now as the nation has slowed down economically, we've seen delinquency pick up in South Sound. So that market, we've seen total dollars not too dissimilar to the east side, go up about $280 in the last four years, but absolute 20% higher rent growth in that market from four years ago. So I'm always bullish on South King. It's a great job center, but it needs the urban core to rise in rental rates to displace renters and push them down there. And we're not really going to see that in mass until we see growth in the urban core, is my, is my theory on that. Next, moving over to Snohomish County, like I had said, they've had a really strong run up. We saw steady rent growth early cycle. We saw a lot of development come in to South Snohomish, not much in North Snohomish. We've seen good rental rates, did very well during COVID, but it's kind of at par now year over year. And I think once again in the North uh, counties, we're hitting threshold pricing. And we're just not seeing new renters come to that market getting displaced out of Seattle, North King, uh, Linwood, some of those markets that push them up further into North Snohomish, pushing those rental rates. And overall, vacancy has been relatively in control. As you can see, it's bounced around a little bit over the last 10 years, and that's really just based upon demand in that market, really coming from displacement from the core markets. But we have seen it run up, and with rents in equilibrium and vacancy starting to tick up, the question is, are we able to push pricing? And I think the short answer is it's going to be very hard to push pricing without economic growth. And as everyone in this room knows, it's really hard to cut expenses. So we're, we're just seeing NOI get eroded in that market pretty strongly, but overall, it's performed really well. On a total percentage basis, it's had the most rent growth in the last four years in any other market. And I think there's going to be a lot of resilience on the north end, both north of downtown Seattle and Snohomish. I just think it's going to take some time to get there. Now, switching down to Pierce County, Pierce County has been a very polarized market because we had this real steady run up over a number of years because we really did not see growth happen there until 2016 or 17 but we ran rent so high all of a sudden we're at a point we can't raise them anymore and this is all the time you can see this is a perfect graph of what happens when landlords are constantly trying to find and hunt for where rental rates are supposed to be and then you see a bunch of new supply get added to Tacoma. So I would say if we strip out downtown Tacoma, this vacancy is not running up nearly as high. Pierce County and the suburbs are actually really strong right now, but in urban Tacoma, as I like to call it, as it's trying to urbanize, we just saw too much development. And we can say it was an ozone issue or a flight from Seattle issue, but we'll see some of the development slides there in a moment. So overall, Pierce is at that point of equilibrium. I think they're gonna get into disequilibrium and it's gonna take another couple quarters to get out of it as we absorb a spate of new development. And so overall total dollars looks kind of like the rest of the region, almost 20% growth, but most of that growth was seen earlier cycle and right post COVID. And looking at Kitsap, Kitsap was a really sleepy market. It's been a great market and all of a sudden it just shot up during COVID. I had sold a building over in Kitsap in 2020. We closed the week after COVID, it was April 2020 and the buyer was like, ah, I don't know how I'm gonna feel about this. And 20 months later, I think we had sold it for 16 million. They got appraisal at 27 million. And that's just how much rents had grown in Kitsap and how much there was a flight out of Seattle. But now we've seen that it just has not been able to sustain those rent levels. And we've seen development in Silverdale, development in Bremerton. And so as you can see, early cycle, vacancy was really, really low, even at the same time rents were picking up but you can see with this delivery of new supply. So it really is a, a, a new supply issue because we never see charts go up so much and drop down so much. I always give a plug to my dear friends at Dupre and Scott. Back when we had better vacancy data that stripped out new construction, we could normalize and just look at market vacancy versus total vacancy. So there's a lot of noise in these numbers, but what we're seeing is we're probably three, four quarters away from it being a healthy market in Kitsap but we just, it just can't absorb that much new supply. 
So again, total dollars, about 200, but it also started at much lower rents and normalized. Across the region, we've seen about 15 to 20% rent growth in the last four years, except for Seattle. And that's the only market that's really stagnated. So looking at projections, so this is a slide I like to look at and then throw away because I'll never be right. But this is CoStar rent projections. This is the cycle we loved. Remember those times? It was fun. This was great. And then we got into this time, less fun. Then we got into this time. It was like, oh, it's picking back up. It's fun again. And then we got to this time. And so uh, I don't have a, you know, we all look at FOMC and what they're saying every day, whether we're going to have a soft landing, hard landing, medium landing, take off again. Um, you all see the data. I'm not going to pontificate into that. Someone once told me if, if someone's quoting what's happening with Treasury, stop listening. Um, but what we're looking at is just another run up in the cycle. And I believe this is going to happen. I don't think it's going to be as smooth as this shows, but it's basically this is the exact trend line is the last cycle, which tells me their economists don't know jack shit. No offense, but this is what economists do when they don't know what's going to happen is they take the past, trend it forward. And I think they're feeling comfortable we're going to get back to that in the next year or so. And I can show you this graph from 2021, and it showed up and to the right of like 6 or 8% rent growth for several years. And then in 2022, I pulled this up in September, and it showed 3% rent growth for like two to 300 years out in the future. So it's just, it's really hard to look at these, but I like to show them because everyone wants to look at them. So overall takeaways from rent and vacancy, number one, you've heard me use the word equilibrium a thousand times so far. That's really where we are in the market. Um, again, vacancy occupancy, it's very fragile right now. It's really about demand side, job growth, and what's happening with development. Those are the really two things to watch. I think there's good urban deals, there's good suburban deals. It's really a question of those micro, those micro market factors of whether you're gonna see demand at your building. And then again, urban versus suburban, I think it's less of a question. I think that's more of a capital question, what your capital is comfortable with. On the ground, it, it's kind of the same in all markets. Um, and then finally, impacts work from home. I, I call myself a work from home denier. Maybe it's because my wife told me I can work from home or stay married, so it's a very easy choice for me. I went back to the office and I've stayed since. I do think we're gonna see a lot of people coming back to the office, and I think we're gonna start to see that by the tail end of next year. I think it's, this year's a little bit too soon. Taking a look at the development pipeline, see if we're staying on track. Um, I simplified these because we've, we've gone through these slides and looked at what happened the last 10, 15 years. Overall, what we're hyper-focused on is what's happening in the next 36 months. So this is data for just Seattle and Seattle surrounding neighborhoods. I looked back this morning and looked at the data. On average, from 2014 to even 2019, we were delivering between 3,500 and 6,500 units every year in this same market segment. So 7,800 isn't anomalous, but it was also in heavier demand markets where we could actually absorb these units, not when we were in equilibrium. So that is a ton of units, and it's a lot of units. I think some will spill over to next year, but you look at this drop off into 2025 and 2026, it is dropping off markedly. And the big question is demand gonna pick up to meet the market, but we are seeing all of these deliveries really coming in in the next 12 to 18 months, and it's gonna drop off sharply. Now, if we layer in that North King, there's a lot of units coming in North King, but once we get out of Seattle and North King, for the rest of these, we have zero deliveries in 2026. So if we look up in um, Snohomish County, we look up east side, or past the east side, we look down south, all of these markets, I would say Pierce, this is again the Tacoma issue that we're having, they've got a ton of units delivering, they need to absorb and they'll get back to equilibrium, but we've got to get through that, but if you look, they're not delivering anything in 2025. Some will spill over, but there's really not that much at all beyond this year in that market. And so if you look in total, it's a lot of units. Um, I'm a fan of the technical term shit ton. I don't know if you could put that in your decks, but there are a lot of units coming and just normalized across this last cycle. In the last seven years, we averaged just over 10,000 units a year. So when you look at this, it's not anomalous that we can absorb all these units, but I'd say there is massive concentration risk in certain markets. I think the bigger risk is, I think the time to be in the market is this year and probably early next year. And I don't think we're gonna post rent growth, really true good rent growth, till beyond that. 
So I think the average investor that has to rely on capital is looking at what's going on in the market today, there's a strong chance of missing the market. Because by the time we get through and see real rent growth, I think we're gonna see the capital markets reform, we're gonna hit price discovery, and we're gonna see prices escalate. So that's the real equation right now, you go by your gut and you go by the data. And John's gonna tell us the right answer in a few minutes. Um, looking at the development pipeline, first thing, we just really hit a wall, the data shows it. Next, concentration challenges. Uh, we'll have our new report out in um, June this year, development report, where we map every single new development so you can see where they're hitting. It doesn't look much different than last year's report, so you can just look at last year's report for a sneak preview, because there hasn't been many starts. So and it's pretty accurate, but you can look and see where those concentration risks are right now. Um, costs are abating a bit. A GC in the room told me I couldn't quote him at 20% reductions, but I have his business card. So if you developers want to talk with this guy, I'll, I'll let you know. I think we're comfortable with probably 10% off the top. That next 5 to 7% is getting negotiated right now. But the real question is, until capital comes in and lowers yield requirements, and until we see rent growth, it's going to be really hard to stitch together development deals. Um, and most of what I'm hearing from developers is they're looking at 2026. They're looking at next cycle. So they're looking at these next cycle starts because that's when they think the capital will be back in the market and that's what they're hearing from their committees is tie things up, but it's going to be really hard to get them closed or earnest money, non-refundable until we really understand the fundamentals of the next 24 months. Sales trends. Um, the sales market's been a really tough market to track. Um, this is a, a, a quick comic strip of about what we're seeing in the marketplace. I would say in the last 90 days, you could take the, the back third and move them over to the commercial real estate window. We're starting to see healthier marketplace of buyers. We brought something to market recently. We had 18 bids and we came in within guidance. Now we were guiding very realistically. Um, we just collected another almost 10 bids on something. We had a call for offer this week. So we are making a marketplace right now. We've chosen not to overprice and try to sell everything in the market. We've been very strategic of trying to close on what we take to market. And we've been very effective with that. The challenge has been investors showing up. Um, we'll talk about some of the fundamentals, but overall looking at the cycle, this is transaction dollars. We had a good run up through 16. I think that was the true peak because I didn't realize an excise tax was gonna change. It dropped off in 17, 18. That's when we just didn't have a lot of strong rent growth in the market. People would kind of settle down from that peak. Excise tax got announced, <laughs> rent growth shot up, and we had like this second run um, at the market, followed by COVID. Don't need to tell you about what happened, transaction volume there. We did pick up in 21. As you know, capital markets went crazy, rent growth went crazy. People were buying on what I call COVID rent rolls. So depressed rent rolls, we were doing low three, mid three cap deals. It was the go-go times of about 18 months. And then 22, we had decent volume, but 90, 70 to 90% of this was closed by September. We had almost no transaction volume, the, the, the back nine of 22 due to the interest rate hikes. And then here we are in 2023, depending on your sector, if it's private capital, we're probably down 50% in transaction volume. When it's institutional, it might be 70, 70 to 80% down in just sheer transaction volume. And you look at this as number of transactions. So we had a peak number of transactions early cycle, they held up, and that should be 173 with the dollar sign, that's just number of deals. So 173 apartment transactions, five units or greater closed last year, and we had been previously up in excess of 500. So just a, a material slowdown in transaction volume. And so looking at cap rates, what that equates to, I'd say 2019 was the, pro the last kind of normalized capital markets environment. And it was a healthy spread. We saw sub four caps and we saw greater than six caps, but the spread from urban quality assets to suburban was about a four and a half to a six and a quarter. And that's what the data shows normalized for having I'd say healthy 350 to 500 transactions a year, we could really get good cap rates. We go over to 2021, 2022, and it's amazing, we're within a 50 basis point spread. So we just we normally see cap rates gap out at least 100 to 200 basis points from core to suburban. And over the years, that gap's gone less, maybe 100 basis points or 150. We got down to 50 basis points. Just a really anomalous time in the market create massive valuations and made people feel really good, but it also got a lot of capital back into the market 
And that's where we're seeing trouble right now. If you look at last year, they've crept up, but we just didn't have enough transaction volume to really prove out truly where they were. So these numbers, I'd say these aren't indicative of the market. What I put up here is my sense of where I think the market is, is most transactions are happening between a five and a six. We'll see some four sevens, four nines post, we'll see some six and a half post, but we're starting to gap out. We've got a hundred basis point gap now. We still have another 50 to go. My guess is we're gonna trade 50 in the core for maybe 25 in the suburbs as we see people get some confidence coming back into the more core markets. So just takeaways, um, stagnation in the sales market, valuations fell. I think really peaked to trough, if you had really, I probably looked at 10 LOIs from 21, 22 that actually closed in 23. They were off by 30%. This is from a true LOI in the market that probably would have transacted to a deal that closed 18 to 24 months later. But overall, I think 20% is probably the bracket for most people. Buyers are back. I mentioned this earlier. I'm starting to hear that if we're not at the bottom, we're close enough. So we're seeing people come back in the marketplace, which creates a marketplace, which makes it healthy. And then what is the right price? And I, I put, if it's a sold listing, it's probably within 10% of the ask. If it's a stale listing, it's greater than 10 or 15%. And that's really demarking from what's selling and what's not selling. It's really hard to get buyers and sellers to come to the table, and the reasons make perfect sense. But if you're wider than 10%, I'd argue even 7%, it's very hard to sit a deal together right now. Right on time. Mr. Albertson, when we come up, we're gonna rearrange things here and get started with the next portion. years ago when I met you. Is <laughs> mine working? Uh, well, I, I think a lot of people in this room know John Algerman either a personal relationship or just by reputation. For those that, that don't, I feel really fortunate to be, can I say luminary? Absolutely. All right. Whatever, whatever works for you. We're sitting here with a real luminary. Um, John, uh, so John's with, with Timberlane Partners there. One of the reasons I wanted to have John here, other than just being a, a, a really active market participant, especially in the transactional market where I think there's the most opacity right now. Um, he's seen both sides of it, but also in his current role, I'd say they're the most active buyer of closed deals in the Northwest. And, and, and that might expand other markets, but I think he can add some really valuable guidance here. But John, just like take us back a little bit. When did you get into real estate? So I, uh, I didn't really exactly plan on getting into real estate. So it, um, I was going to go to law school because you were an attorney. I remember we went 14 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So that was kind of my plan. But uh, I went to high school up north. I grew up on the east side. And so when I was going through Rush, I just watched uh, Animal House like probably five times. I thought that was a good idea. So I pledged a house in John Torrance, anybody who uh, Torchies, John was the uh, sales manager at CB, and the house was so bad that I was the uh, rush chairman as a freshman and the president as a sophomore. And okay. so I thought, it, and uh, it was a lot of us that kind of turned around. He said, "You get people to join this place. You should be in sales." And I was like, "No, I'm going to go do something." I was an accounting major, so I uh, took the CPA exam. And I was um, uh, working at Ernst and what was then Ernst and Winnie, uh, now Ernst and Young, and I just decided I. I've been a researcher one one uh, summer, and I just remember kind of watching the energy and everything that was going on. I never really pictured myself doing it at the time, but uh, I just like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. So I uh, called up John, and uh, 22 interviews it took me. Because you, know, you had to find somebody who would take you on, and everybody's like, if you're an accountant, like, you can't sell. It's like, this is crazy. And so finally, they put me in apartments. I wanted to do industrial. So I was like, okay, put you in apartments, put you in investment sales. And so that was in uh, 1987. I was 26 years old. So I was there at CB for 36 years. And from my numbers of just under 1,200 transactions and 27 billion in transaction volume? That, is that right? Did I do my math? Yeah. 
So um, I think most people with a career like that are going to ride off into the sunset or stick with it. Um, you, you found yourself uh, at Timberlane now. What, can you walk us through the move? Because I think a lot of people were surprised to hear about it. Yeah, it, I'm so excited to be on the principal side. It's something that I had really thought about for a long time. I've been, like a lot of people in here, you're probably a limited partner and you've been investing in apartments. You know, you can, all of us can invest in the stock market, and probably a lot of us do. But you know, your stock broker calls you up and tells you to buy Boeing or Microsoft. And, Okay, you know, that sounds good, but I kind of decided that if I couldn't figure out a way to make money in apartments, that something was really drastically wrong, since that's what I do all day. And so I really wanted to go over the principal side at the right time, and I had seen more money made in uh, the cycles, you know, you know, starting back the last one, you know, 9, 10, 11, if you bought in those years, going back to 9, 11, and the first Iraq war, that was a little shallower, so 203. And then the Wayback Machine to the SNL crisis, that was a really long one. That was 91, 92, 93, 94. And if you look at, and I thought, of all the transactions that were done then, there were more money made in those, those specific time frames than the rest of the 35 years put together. And so I was just waiting until the right time. The financial crisis when that hit, that wasn't for me. And so I brought on Eli Hamsek to kind of hand it off to him. In fact, when you and I met, Eli was in the process of kind of winding down at Holland. And so uh, we talked, and we met the very, the very early on. It was the most polite interview I had in brokerage. I won't mention some of the other interviews I had, but it was very polite. We talked for a long time. It was, it was a polite I knew this guy was going to do very, very well from the first time I met him. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, I, I was just waiting, because if you, you know, if you go through as a broker, you know, 9, 10, 11, you certainly want to ride the, the wave. And then when COVID hit, I thought, okay, I'm the only one that was a fan of like, okay, here, I'm going to get a chance to go onto the principal side. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take interest rates down to zero. We're going to do a stimulus package and a stimulus package. And like, two are good, why not do six? And so we took an asset bubble and we just made it even bigger. And then with interest rates, that was kind of the final straw. And then that kind of burst. And so when that happened, then it was a, a function of, okay, uh, you know, where where's the right place? And it's kind of strange when you know, you know the two partners I work for, they're you know, twenty some odd years younger than I am. So it's kind of well, kind of strange. Like, okay, you know, what are you going to do here? Like, it was, so uh, that's uh, I was very fortunate to get to be able to uh, to get the opportunity to work with the Timberlane crew. And 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 I know those guys. I'm privileged to have known Dave over there for a long time. And what what was it? You know not having a long, like a super long relationship with them and their business, what was it like that about their thesis and the opportunity that attracted you to it? They had a good reputation. I, I, uh, I like the fact that um, they didn't just come and go through a, an auction process and just outbid everybody. I would see a trans I would see a property that they acquired and it's like, wow, I didn't even see that on the market or that seems like a really good price per unit. And, they were pretty scrappy, very clever, uh, disciplined. During the run-up, they weren't you know, loading up on variable rate debt to, to create returns. They were actually net sellers um, in the last you know two or three years. And uh, I met them both right when they had started their company back in 2012. I remember distinctly the building I was in in Des Moines when I met Dave and John for the first time. And uh, they have a great reputation. Everybody likes those guys, and, and so just was a perfect fit. I, I did not. I had other other opportunities to work with companies, with clients that were in San Francisco and LA. And I'm like you, I like to go to the office. And uh, I did not want to be remote. I wanted to be in an office every day. So that was a really important thing. Given your history of these other market cycles, I, I think people can envision a business plan of, of buying a downturn but executing on that business plan is much harder. Can you walk us through a little bit of, of how you guys are looking at the market, you, like your team, and what, what gives you conviction right now? Well, I, you know, it's tough. In, in this, it's, it's great to see these slides I'm thinking to myself while I'm watching them. If we were in here in 2011 or 10, those slides would be completely different. They'd be upside down. A lot of people through that. 
That's what's unusual about this cycle, is that the fundamentals are actually, considering what we've gone through, you know, they're really strong. And this is really just because interest rates have spiked. And last year, it was pretty unsettling. We had a couple of deals that were on, on contract. And we have no idea where the rates are going to land while we're going through that. And so you just really have to have you know, the three C's. You, know, you have to have the, the, the conviction, you know, the cash, and the courage to step up when everybody else is like, you know, what, you know, they, they think you're crazy. I and mean, we had a lot of partners looking at us go, what are you guys doing? But if you, if you buy properties at, you know, 20 to 30 percent below peak pricing replacement cost, I mean, that's a, that's a formula that has always prevailed. And it's no similar to the, the other cycles that I, that I saw. So a, a big prevailing argument to the, the flip side of that is we don't want to buy below replacement. I mean, we don't want to buy negative leverage. We don't want our going in cap rate to be, you know, even at par with our debt, but especially below the debt. How have you guys looked at that? You know, by May measure, you you guys have closed on three transactions in this market. Bernie told me there might be a fourth in the hopper. We'll go and talk about that. Um, so you guys have been active. I don't think there's been another group that's bought two in that time frame especially of size when not much is transacting over 30 to 40 million. How are you guys looking at going in cap rate? How are you looking at, at yield versus rent growth? So I think that's one of the reasons that the market has uh, filled in a little bit more this year as far as the number of buyers and, and the competitiveness is that everybody last year, I think, was, was anticipating that we were going to be able to buy with positive leverage. and. When you get, you know, I think what we we were looking at, okay, we're thirty percent below peak. You know, clearly the Fed could care less about commercial real estate. If anything has been <laughs> proven, it's that, right? And so, oh, you if, if you were caught off size because you took advantage of these really low interest rates and variable rate debt, and you're going to lose like thirty percent of your equity, you know, that's that's okay. That's your, you know, that's the risk that you've taken. And commercial real estate's made plenty of money over the years. But it starts going down, you know, much more than that. You're like, oh, it's going to go down more. I'm like, really? I mean, if that goes down much more, these regional banks are really, really strained. I think the Fed has just basically told them, look, we're not going to press this. You just make sure the keys, you know, stay in the, uh, in the borrower's hands, and we're going to work through this and live to fight another day. And so, just didn't seem that they could go down anymore. And so so they were down enough, I guess, would be the right way to describe it. And so then you look at the math, and we really wanted to make sure that we felt like we could get to positive leverage in a relatively short period of time. And the nice thing about what we've been buying in the city, and, and uh, you talk, you said a lot of good things about, and I totally agree with return to work and what's going on and everything. This has been a really tough situation for the city. Uh, compared to others, uh, other states and how they've handled COVID. And we're all going to come back. It's going to come back. And so we just looking at the rent roll and how challenged it is with all of the, uh, the rules there are, that, um, that it, how difficult it is from the landlord's perspective. We just saw a lot of embedded value just in the rent roll where we think market rents are. And so that's how we convinced ourselves that we're going to see you know, positive leverage in a fairly short period of time. But we, we did not wait until, oh, okay. Yeah, all the cap rates, you know, above the, the uh, you know, interest rates. So, I will say I'm still hearing now is there's going to be more pain. There's going to be more pain. I think people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. And if, if you look for bad news, you can find it. That's always the case. Um, Dave Enzo with Timberland, one of the principals, told me it was actually our last forum. I've been stealing this from Dave. Where is he? I've been giving him an attribution. But it's hard to buy in volume in an upturn. Meaning that once the market resets, you might get one good deal, but it's hard to get ten. And I don't. I mean, it's great to have a trophy to say you bought the cheapest deal in a cycle, but it's better to amass more units. How have you guys had? How are you guys looking at that? And, and it seems like the thesis of you guys is now it's close enough. Where other people, I think, are just waiting. Like it, there's got to be more pain. There's you know debt maturities. There's all sorts of things. One of the, ch the challenges is you've got to find a seller. Okay, it's much easier today than it was 12 months ago. Today, there's enough data points and enough transactions where you can kind of settle in, but 
the guidance last year, and you know, I get it. You know, as a broker, you're you're competing, and you've got to go and try to to lean into it and believe that things are going to get better. And so you look at all these comps, and it's like, hey, you know. So last year there was a lot of disconnection, and so the trick was to find somebody who really was actually going to transact. And so then when that happens, then it got it would get crowded. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't in a vacuum. Everything that we bought last year was really competitive. You know, you know round one, you know, step up in round two, interview. You know, the whole the whole thing because we were at a at a level, and then the, the sellers that were and we were competing against all high net worth. So it, it, uh, there wasn't any institution reads. It was really just kind of high high net worth investors that were that were in the market. Picking up on that. I, mean, I, I talked briefly about institutional capital versus private capital. How uh, how's it been for you? You've done deals on both sides as a broker. How's it been you on the principal side having conversations with capital? And, and it's just a whole different equation as a principal. <laughs> Shut the door, well, Nancy. We can talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> we 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 talked. Uh, three of the, two of the deals that we've closed on, we brought in a, a limited partner. Uh, we have a fund that we've raised, so we we've, we've structured with the limited partner. And the, the, the fourth one we're about to to you know acquire here will be the same. And we have you know, calls in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and you can just kind of sense that that most of them really don't have money. I mean, they say they've got a, they all have oh. I have, this billion or these billions. <laughs> so they all say that, right? So you're in there, but then they're they're not really looking to try to you know, move it out. So it, it's it takes it's hard to find like a group that really does have money that wants to place it. And so that's that's number one. Now you, you can't really blame them because they're dealing with redemption queues because they're a lot of these are open ended funds and so they've got to deal with that. They are pretty embarrassed about what they acquired over the last several years and so they're all like, okay, a little bit of job security. Uh, and then you talk about the office market. I mean, everybody in here, we're so lucky to be in apartments. I mean, I had a, my cubicles right next to an investment sales uh, team at CB <coughs> that was some office buildings and they can they'll go like, there, there's no debt. I mean, you, you can have a tenant. Bought the ten-year lease and the and seller financing you can't you can't sell it right now, and so they're looking at just a just a mess with their office portfolio, and you know not, I don't know excuse me I don't know that much about office but I know enough to be dangerous but they just TIs what I hear is just to be able to take these buildings that have that are fifty percent vacant to be able to lease them up the amount of money that that's going to take with TIs. So I, when we go meet these, to answer your question, you meet with them, yes, they have billions of dollars, but you know they've stress test everything. It's like, okay, what if the 10 year goes to five, or this goes to five and a half? How do we get all of this office buildings, you know, stabilized and out of, you know, to off to somebody else? And it's just a, it's just, it's a liquidity crisis across the whole spectrum. So when you're, you know, with capital being scarce, or I'd say capital willing to deploy in these in these fundamentals, I think there there are billions, if not trillions, on the sidelines. You're in the last couple of deals you've you've bid. It's been competitive. What do you do you think there's a uh, sort of an element with your capital that they have the resilience to stay in the deal when it's getting bid up? That I think people have been happy to grab an asset value that's falling, but I we are seeing higher bids and. I think there's not a lot of elasticity in pricing right now. Like you can push someone three or five percent, but getting above seven or ten, is that a conversation you're having with capital, or are they giving you guys like, hey, we like the asset, you guys, you guys prove it out, you've got a little bit of rope. Well, they're you know, they're smart, and they, the way they look at it is they want to see conviction. So, and if we see something that we really like, our approach is you know, we're just going to buy it. So. Okay. With you or without you, yeah, right? And so, you know, we we're not super cavalier about it, but we make it known that this is something that we have 100% conviction in, and this is something we we believe in, and that I think that speaks volume. And, we, and we're you know we're uh, putting up a pretty good chunk of the equity. We're not doing 90 tens or you know that's not that's not where we're at at all. 
if they want conviction, if they feel conviction, then they can get into investment committee. I, I think that's really the key for them to be able to uh, to get approval. It's that uh, you know, they've got boots on the ground, they, they've been in this market a long time, and they're, this, is a, this is a property they want to buy, whether it's with us or, with, or by themselves. It's really interesting when I, I got back from the NMHC last year, I don't know if it was much different this year, back in January, I'd said that there was a ton of optimism, but not much confidence or conviction. And I feel like that's, I think we're all optimistic. We're in commercial real estate, we like apartments, we like our, sec our sector, we're optimistic. But I think that conviction's missing. And I think people want to be able to look up at Axiometrics or CoStar or, God forbid, the Puget Sound Business Journal, when they're quoting rents are right now, and say, okay, the, the herd's with me. And I, I think that's really sage. Given what you guys have bought right now, knowing what you know, would you would you would you have doubled and tripled down, or do you feel like there's still some buying opportunities in the next six twelve months? I think about that a lot. Uh, so I'm glad you brought it up. I I kind of like doing this kind of somewhat steady because there's a lot of things that could go wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> so you know you kind of want to think okay may, maybe something hits. You know, you think every time there's an inflation print. If we started to see inflation go, just you know, oil's going up again now, so that would turn things back in the wrong direction. You know, it's like wrong direction, right? You know what I mean? These things are like you know, you go back and forth. Um, but uh, so, I, uh, to answer your question, I, I kind of like the pace that we've been going at. So I don't think it's over. The point is, I think we've got another 12 to 18 months, and, and then it'll, it'll fill back in. Once it fills back in, it'll fill back in pretty quickly. So. We didn't rehearse these, I gave you some topics, but it does lead naturally to my next question is, those of you old enough in the room to remember, you know, savings and loan crisis, 86, 87, we came into you know, with the, the RTC, and that took four or five years to sort all that out in the early 90s we were talking about. Other cycles seem to have been shorter. I would say 08, 09, I feel like we were kind of getting back two or three years later. We've been bouncing around the bottom since 2020, and obviously there's a lot of manipulation. If you were to peg it, like what does this feel most similar to you? Like if, if you were to sort of date stamp this to previous cycles. This one's really different. This is so different. I mean, every other one of these, the, the economy has just completely collapsed. You don't even want to open your rent roll because you have, it's like a falling knife every month. And this one, the fundamentals are pretty good. It's just you're watching what's going on with the tenure to try to figure out you know what this means and where this is going. And so uh, this is, it, in some ways, it's kind of bounced along longer and, and in some ways more painful. But I think it kind of depends on kind of where where you are. If you have a, a portfolio, you have a bunch of fixed rate debt. You're probably okay. You know, you're probably just fine because the, the performance has done well. Whereas you know. 08, 09, 10, I mean, it, you, you didn't know where it was going to land. And so this is a little bit different. I think about that quite a bit, actually, how the difference between this one and the others. So how are you guys managing your debt expirations on new debt? Uh, I'm not the right answer. I'm going to talk about this. Are you guys buying on five-year money, 10-year money? Yeah, yeah, we're doing five-year IO. We're buying down. So we're doing five years. Just give us flexibility, and we'd like a little bit more flexibility in case things really turn around, you know, more quickly. So, uh, but we're doing fixed. We're not doing variable rate. Okay. So, but you're you're fixing for five years. Yeah, we're doing a third loan. You know, we're at sixty percent. One next one we're going to do is going to be lower than that, but kind of sixty percent LTV. So if you so the thesis is we're here we are twenty three twenty four by twenty six twenty seven. Just based on your thesis, you feel like we're going to be in a, health, a much healthier market. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think these slides, I mean, having this supply just completely crater is is awesome. <laughs> we need it. I mean, that's the only thing that's super positive you hang your hat on. And then uh, and then these companies, they, if the leadership's back in the office, it starts the leadership, but if the leadership's back in the office, everybody's going to figure out they better get back in the office. And it's just a matter of time. The tech companies realize they need to bring it back. This whole COVID experiment was really a miss. And then the third leg, I think, that we're so lucky in the coastal west with the governance that we have has been, it's, it's such a positive that we had the 
change in mayor last year, and then the um, seven council seats now that have flipped. And, and there's a lot of people in this audience that were really active in this, and anybody who is, I take my hat and commend them. And that's the most important takeaway, I think. I was at the BizNow thing last week, or the, it was a good panel on, um, the, it was the waterfront was the topic, but there was a good Seattle panel on there. And this, the city is really turning around in a dramatic way. And we're lucky because Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles are, are far behind us. So I think that that's another reason why if you fast forward two or three years, I think we're gonna be in, in good shape. So when you were at CB, you worked on, I mean, you guys had a Northwest team, but you had visibility in what was going on across the West Coast and other markets. What, what gives you conviction in the Pacific Northwest, or are you guys also looking in Denver, Boise, Salt Lake City, like Timberlands has got a great history there early in Salt Lake City, did really well there. Is there something you see about Seattle where most of your acquisitions have been differently than those other markets, or is it just that's when, where you've seen buying opportunities? The short answer is buying opportunities. There, there's sellers here are, are more motivated, or however you describe it, to kind of meet the market. And it's been difficult in Denver. There's so much more capital, I think. It's more competitive. And uh, because of you know, there's, uh, the perception that Seattle's a disaster, and, the, um, all the governance issues as far as the landlord goes is really problematic and we're just kind of a work done. And so I think there isn't as much money that's flowing here. But uh, but the, the three markets that we like the best are uh, Seattle, Salt Lake, and Denver. But there's, you know, our team really kind of led the West. And there's a lot of, you know, parts of California I really like. I think you, you know, right now you get positive leverage in Portland. I wouldn't want to be in downtown Portland, but I, I Think that the Northwest Corridor and Vancouver and you know there's you know there's a lot of supply in Phoenix and Vegas and I don't know how that kind of plays. I've, just, I've seen that too many times, so I don't know. Well, we're we're running a bit short on time. I've, I've got a couple fun ones. Um, do you remember you know across your career and even today? Was there a, a bold prediction you made in another market cycle at a time that you, you were right, you feel like you really nailed that ahead of time? In our roles, we have to pontificate a lot about what's gonna happen. Is there one out there where you, you, you called the ball? I would say that I was pretty good. It wasn't like one, but I was generally pretty, I had this amazing mentor, so I give him all the credit, but he, he reads everything. And uh, I was always a little bit ahead of the market when it collapsed, and I was generally the first one to start really leaning in on BOVs when it bottomed. And so I was, I was generally not, you know, when it collapsed, I mean, it was really, when it collapses as a broker, there's a lot of strategies, you know, you get scared, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of ways you kind of manage that's a kind of a controlled landing. And so that helped me kind of, you know, try to, try to focus my time on where I could actually make some money. Any any bold prediction where you were wrong? Uh, there's, yeah, I was thinking, you know, you, so many times you're like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know if I have any one one time that I, I, I would I would say that I've been really surprised at how we've lost. The control. I've said, I'm, I'm harping on this. I won't say anything again. But just lost control of the city. I can remember so many times talking to investors. And it's like, no, Seattle, it's fine. And it, it, then, yeah, I woke up and it's like, John, you have to be, you have to be realistic here. This is kind of a mess. That we're <laughs> right here. Like, I think we all got that wrong. I, yeah. That's a fair one. Um, uh, before we wrap up, just a, a couple quick ones. Um, best advice you ever got. I've got so many people gave me so many. I think it's the one that just jumps out the top of my mind is that I got this early on. It's like 90% of what we all do in here is just filling out the lineup card every day, which basically means you just show up. And you just show up every day, you just do what you do, you don't get too up when the things are going great, you don't get too down when things are bad, and you just kind of steady, you kind of plow along. Just keep going. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, What's the most surprising thing to you getting on the principal side? I'm sure you had visions of what the principal side would be like, but what, what's most surprising? No IT. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, when I started, there was no voicemail, okay? I mean, we didn't have, like, a fax. So you would, like, somebody would change, you know, the earnest money from 5000 to 10000 You have to drive over and have them initial it, okay? This is like the Stone Age. I mean, the, 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 the term Rolodex, it was actually, like, a round thing where they had business cards. And you can see a few people check when they're, you know, I'm probably the oldest one in here, but uh, close, you know, it was just like, and so now I'm, I used to at CB, like, I was cute with all these younger people, like, how does this work? And so when I was leaving, my assistant saw me, she says, where are you reading over there? Finally, I called it up, and it's like, it's the yellow book, Outlook for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, what are you doing? You got me here. And then, uh, and then when I said, I now I was leaving, she goes, now I know why you're reading that book. <laughs> Uh, last question. I, 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 at some point, everyone in this room is a buyer and a seller. Uh, you, you've been guiding clients as sellers for decades. Any guidance you have to someone who's a seller of, you know, they may not listen to an active broker in the market, but maybe someone who's done 27 billion. A any guidance you can give to sellers about how to be the best seller to maximize price? Well, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Uh, the sellers I liked the best were the ones that were the toughest, the really, really tough ones. So I'll give you an example. We were working on, I won't name names, but uh, I will tell you who the seller was, was UBS and this guy, Bill Roberts, back in, in the greatest guy's about my age, and just the nicest guy in the world, but man, is this guy tough. And so we're working on this transaction, we're gonna retrade us, and the principal wants to go over and talk to Bill. I'm like, I don't know, you can. And so I call up Bill, I go, I don't want to spring it on him. I say, hey, he wants to talk to you. And he goes, he wants to talk to me? And he's like, tell him that's not a good idea, but I'll, I'll take his call. And so, <laughs> and so you know, an hour later, he calls me. And he, I go, how'd that go? He goes, I'm not talking to Bill again. <laughs> you know, and that's the easiest as far as broke. It's like they, they don't want to. So that, that's the best seller's speed, you know. Yeah, the understanding of things kind of go this way or that way, but it makes it easier as a broker if somebody's really tough. You know their stance. Yes. Uh, we've got a little bit of time for uh, one or two questions. Anyone from the audience have any questions? All right. Well, sounds good. I want to I round of applause for, for John. Thanks to all of you guys for coming. Thanks to the team to put this all together. And wish you guys a happy spring. And we're bullish. So look forward to hearing from you.